Thank you, Kenny, and uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here, I think, because you heard Taryn talk at the CIFA conference about the Syria Guide on Archaeology. Um, Taryn was one of the four main authors of this guide. Unfortunately, Taryn couldn't be here today, so um, I'm here in her place. Um, but I was involved at the start and the end of the project. I'm very happy to talk about this guide, and I am a disciple of it and how we can use it to change the value conversation about archaeology within construction. Uh, I'll just start with a little bit of background. I have got the... Yeah. Um, Syria, uh, and this caused quite a lot of confusion in, in MOLA at the start because people thought we were doing a guide to Syria. Um, it was a bit of disappointment when it was <laughs> revealed what it was. Um, Syria is the Construction Industry Research and Information Asso Association. It's a, a neutral, independent, not-for-profit body. And their vision, I quote, is to be a leading enabler and preferred partner for performance improvement, driving collaboration across built environment and construction sectors for the identification, development and transfer of knowledge. So they're a, they're a membership body and they do conferences, CPD, research, publications and guides. The four most recent uh, publications are not, uh, I'll give you just an example of them, a non-destructive testing of civil structures, hazardous ground, gas and site management guide, archaeology and construction good practice, and a manual on scour at bridges. Um, and the point to make here, really, is that the 2021 Syria Guide is written primarily for the construction industry. And while it's a, a good practice guide, like many other guides, and there are other regional guides to how to do archaeology and so on, this one is, is slightly different. Well, it's quite different, I think, in it focuses on how an integrated team which embraces the public benefit purpose of archaeology can benefit program, budget, certainty, safe and healthy working, energy efficiency, environmental performance, and meet social value and sustainability goals. And I read, read the, reread the guide on the way up today on the train, and it is noticeable how different the language is, but also how it reflects what I think we're being hearing from our clients and the construction sector about what they want out of archaeology. So in the next 20 minutes or so, or 15 minutes probably, I'll explain the context, uh, give you a very speedy glimpse of it, and consider how we might use it to change the value conversation. So, um, the context of this guidance, of this guide, is the extraordinary times in which we're in. It's post pandemic, post-Brexit, post-recession, probably pre-another recession, post-COP26, post-cheap energy. The construction industry is under a lot of pressure to level up, to build back better, to address climate change and drive nature recovery and create healthy, inclusive, greener, safer spaces. So it's important in preparing this guide to understand these pressures and understand how our audience, the construction sector, sees its obligations and aspirations. We took an in initial um, uh, consultation at the start with a range of organisations acting in the sort of construction business. And three areas in particular were highlighted as especially strong current drivers. And these are sustainability, value-driven design, and digital innovation, which follows on quite nicely, nicely from the uh, last paper. So just starting with um, sustainability, um, as, as you all know, Planning policy across the UK is built on sustainability objectives. Contractors and developers are expected to contribute not only to economic strength, but to social resilience and environmental sustainability. So it was important in the Syria Guide to show how archaeology can contribute to meeting construction and development targets and how archaeology contributes to the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals and to EDI and SEE targets and to carbon sequestration goals, well-being and placemaking, and the economic, environmental and social gains that we look to construction and development to deliver. And this focus on sustainability is right at the front of, of the guide. It's also clear um, is the increasing scale and changing attitudes around value-driven design and social procurement. With roots in legislation like the Welsh Wellbeing Act, the Localism and Social Value Acts, public sector procurement spend has been rising. It rose by 17% last year to reach 357 billion, and the Social Value Portal estimated that the UK construction industry is creating a social value opportunity of around 30 billion last year, and it's set to increase um, according to the National Social Value Conference, which took place a couple of months ago. 
So as well as increased scale, changed attitudes are evident in the private sector too. Um, Taryn in her talk quoted a tough budget-driven developer. I won't reveal who it is. But they've commented, it's all different now. This was in the feedback in our, in our consultation. Um, ESG is now right at the front of the pitch deck. Translated, that means environmental, social and governance values are not an afterthought or nice-to-haves. They are drivers. They're a business of imperative. Firms are winning tenders and repeat business on their ESG values, innovation and outcome. And I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, and I'm sure m many of you have come across this. I mean, one of our trustees... Who, who operates in government, is always banging on about the requirement for public, uh, public sector tenders to deliver on social value. And I can't remember now whether it's 10% of the score or whatever is on social value. And, and again, I'm, if any of you have been involved in HS2, I think it's an example of the project at a, at a wider level where the messaging has shifted on the project from getting to Birmingham um, very quickly with enough capacity to sustainability. And I think the... the the role of archaeology and the, and the um, uh, weight of archaeology in the, in the project has sort of risen as a result of that. And the third area is, is um, where the construction industry goals are, are sort of... We, we got, we, our feedback showed was, 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 there was interest, was in digital. Digital in, innovation, there's a new opportunity to share and link data, again, which is what we've just been ta talking about. Um, but drawing on our abilities in predictive modelling feeding into operation and maintenance plans, providing speedy and accurate UAV surveys, off-site modelling and so on, all making processes more efficient, greener, quicker, cheaper and more productive and contributing to construction targets and turning the value conversation. We actually have something to feed into other people's models and KPIs. And obviously digital also enables greater engagement and communication with communities. So this was the context for the Syria 2021 guide, which itself was a co collaboration uh, with a project steering group and authors. And we had insight and peer review by a multi multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary board chaired by Ed Wilson of the Environment Agency. And the research and order authorship was a collaboration between MOLA, CIFA and Heritage Works. So co-authored co by Christina Holloway, Kate Geary, Pete Hinton, Gillian King and Taryn. And huge thanks to the many individuals who provided comment and review, some of whom are in the room today. So, um, just in case you're not going to buy it, um, let me tell you uh, a little bit about the guide quickly and give you a sense of it. So, the initial stakeholder consultation involved contractors, developers, environmental specialists, engineers, architects, planners, project managers and heritage managers. And they told us what the guide must say and also what they hoped it would say. So it must, and it does set out, the legal policy and safety obligations, how to avoid, avoid surprises or delay or unexpected costs, and how to ensure uh, and measure good practice. And they hoped it would set out, and it does, how earliest possible involvement is key to avoiding redesign costs or delay and designing in value how proper team integration and collaborative culture is mutually beneficial and creates safer, greener, more efficient and innovative working, and how identifying shared goals and outcomes not only better meets the programme and budget, but also adds value to the whole project. So, uh, the guidance is in two parts, principles and practice. Principles addresses the role and purpose of archaeology and construction to, to deliver public benefit, legislation and policies, our profession and standards, who's who, and a note on procurement. Safety, health, and environment and well-being are emphasised throughout, plus a dedicated chapter sets out the position established by FAME on how archaeology is treated in the CDM regulations and looks at how and where archaeologists work and where the interfaces with construction may differ. Part two puts the principles into practice, and to do that, we worked with the project steering group to set out a simplified, generic construction process of five stages, from feasibility, which includes pre-project and master planning, pre-acquisition due diligence, through planning application, i.e. pre-construction, through detailed design, construction, from project mobilisation through operation phase, to use stages, so termination, handover, and ongoing use. And each stage in the guide gets a chapter. And... To understand the main interfaces between archaeology and construction and their outputs and outcomes, 
The guide shows what good looks like using a generic archaeology process. To be clear, these generic stages are advice to help all parties understand, collaborate and communicate through, throughout the project. This is not a prescriptive framework. Indeed, um, the highly iterative nature of archaeology is emphasised throughout the guide. The guide also includes, um, and there's no way you can see this here, um, uh, but a, a best fit correlation of construction, archaeology and EI, I, EIA processes and milestones against some of the construction sector control frameworks, so like GRIP, um, that's Governance for Railway Investment, I'm sure you know, and NSIPs, uh, and the REBA Plan of Work. Um, this is actually, uh, we found this very useful, um, and just been adapting this for different clients to show where things should happen in the, in the whole process. So taking a very speedy look at one of the chapters, this is one on detailed design and the preparation of a detailed archaeological WSI. Um, you can see a key message box, and that emphasises the WSI's use in quality and control approvals and communications across the whole project. There's uh, an activities in each of the um, chapters. There's a, that key message box and activities. So here there are clear step-by-step -step activities are given for each stage, written from a construction sector perspective. And uh, the next page... You can see there are case studies thread spread throughout the text. There's 28 altogether from a wide range of organisations. Um, this one here is um, from the Costain and HS2 Limited, where the early career archaeologist traineeships run by Mola Headland delivered against overall contractor performance indicators for skills, employment and education, and equality, diversity and inclusion. So, and then the next page, there's a detailed understanding box. And on this one, it includes a simple tool um, an integrated team might use to identify themes, outcomes, and measures. And I don't know if anyone's been involved with um, sort of social value, it's TOMS, it's the sort of TOMS toolkit. Um, many contractors will have their own social value frameworks in place, of course, uh, but I bet a very few of them yet recognise where archaeology can contribute. And on the last page of the detailed design stage chapter, uh, a detailed understanding box gives a prompt list of what a construction team can expect an archaeological WSI to contain in line with the CIFA standard and planning authority expectations. And again, this is integrated and correlated to the plans that the construction team are required to produce, such as construction phase plans, materials management plans, and environmental management plans. And at the end of the guide, a flowchart summarises all of the activities. And if, oh, am I, yes, I'm right. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see again, the guide captures the archaeology construction interfaces and covers approvals, quality monitoring, planning condition discharge, and so on. So what, what the authors of, and, and the project steering group aimed for is a clear, accessible, future-proofed, largely jargon-free, good practice guide with really useful prompt lists detail where helpful, and key messages for emphasis. It applies to projects of all scale, UK-wide, all different nations, on land, coast, and estuary. Um, in PDF or print, it's uh, £30 to Syria members, and many Syria members will already have access to the guide because they get a, they're on a subscription. So um, if you're a non-member, it's £60. Um, that might be quite steep for a holiday read, but as a project cost, uh, we'd suggest that this, this standard serial pricing is pretty modest client investment for a big return. So um, that was a little whistle-stop tour to the guide. Um, I haven't brought any to sell, which is perhaps one of the failings of, of, uh, of Syria. They do sell them through their, um, th through their website. But if you want to know more, I do have a PDF copy, but I can't send it out to everyone. But do, do come and talk to me if you want to see, see a copy. Um, but this brings me to the final question, really, and it's the important one, is if and how the Syria Guide could change the value conversation or help us change the value conversation. Um, this, this conversation among our construction and development colleagues and clients has changed and is still evolving. So now is our opportunity to change the perceptions of, one, the value of archaeology as part of construction, and two, of archaeologists too. So this is just a good practice guide, but it is a guide published by a leading construction industry influencer, not by an archaeological group, 
and it's a promoter of good practice, and it's endorsed by major construction and historic environment sector organisations. Its key messages address the imperatives for early engagement, quality and performance management and principles and obligations. Importantly, it identifies the breadth of ways in which archaeology can contribute. In this, we use the term social value as defined by the social value portal, where it is an umbrella term for the net gains provided to society, because in the world of public sector procurement, that is how our clients will be seeing this. And it shows how mutually beneficial outcomes are created by embracing the purpose of archaeology at the heart of a project and agreeing collaboratively with what the archaeology is going to deliver, which happily is a million miles away from managing the risk of archaeological work impacting on construction activities. We know that what archaeologists do can change lives, and we know that archaeology can make places special, cared for, and all senses of the world successful. We also know that archaeologists have been creating social value for decades, but often we've had to do it from inside the risk box, and sometimes in spite of, and not being valued as an integral part of the construction project. That's not only very hard to do, but it's also self-limiting. So the question is, could this guide be used as a tool, a catalyst even to change the conversation, increase our social value capacity, and alter how people value the role of archaeology as part of construction? Now, at this stage in the uh, CIFA conference, Taryn uh, sort of issued a couple of calls to action to, to consider. And the first one is, um, and I don't think it necessarily has to be linked to this guide, this, this one, can we agree to change our conversation? Let's not let archaeology get stuck in the risk box, um, mitigating adverse development impacts, polluter pays, that sort of thing, any more than any other part of the project should. And let's, as individuals and organisations, make our conversation an advocacy about shared and measurable goals and outcomes that both deliver the project, and yes, of course, that includes risk management, but also benefit society through well-being, placemaking, education, etc. And what I was thinking on the way up is, if, if we're trying to change our conversation, what does that actually look like? Um, and perhaps an example is, if we're asked to tender by a developer, and we've got questions, as well as asking for the red line boundary around the site, do we ask them immediately what their KPIs are on social value? Do we ask them what their environmental, social you know, uh, and governance ESG goals are? Do we put that right at the front of our questions to make the point that that's what we're contributing, not just discharging a planning condition? And two, Taryn's uh, other uh, call to action was let's try and use this guide. It, it exists and... As I say, it's, it's in the construction sector, and we can use it as a tool for prompting those value-based uh, and outcomes-based collaboration. So raising the question of um, sustainable development and um, what, what are, uh, are they building a well-being? Do they have a social value framework that they need us to, to contribute to? And, and so on. Um, so we, we, that's what we're going ahead and using it for. And um, certainly CIFA as well are uh, organising, uh, creating a, a CPD session uh, which can be rolled out. And uh, one thing Taryn says is if uh, a CPD session about the Syria Guide would be useful for your clients, projects, organisations, do approach CIFA and they will um, be able to, I think they're pulling this together uh, sort of at the moment. So... I think my final slide to close. The 2021 Serial Guide places archaeology unapologetically alongside construction as important contributors to our sustainable future. The authors and project board hope it will be used to help turn the conversation away from risk containment alone towards recognition of the commercial and social value that archaeology as part of construction can bring to projects, places and people. Thank you. <laughs>